our first uh, project this morning is presenting our poster winners. And to do that, I have Maria Hernandez here with me. She's the uh, chair of the poster committee. Please welcome Maria Hernandez. So good morning all. Um, as Mariana said, I am Dr. Maria Hernandez, chair of the 2023 poster committee. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to all of you for being here today, supporting our uh, poster presenters, presenters. And I really hope that you all had uh, a chance to visit and review uh, our poster session. Um, so to the authors, I hope you are all around here. Uh, thank you for submitting an abstract and thank you for uh, coming uh, down to here to present uh, your uh, research poster. Um, so we must say that you all did a great job and that it's been quite hard for us uh, to choose the winners. So congratulations and please keep uh, submitting posters. So um, without uh, further delay, um, I will announce the winners. So please, I will ask uh, the winners to come here. Uh, the third place goes to uh, Anne-Marie van der Waal from the University of Amsterdam. Welcome to my presentation about the clinical reasoning process in patients with temporal mandibular related somatic tinnitus a case series. The prevalence of tinnitus in an adult population is between 10 to 15 percent. But the prevalence of tinnitus in patients with temporal mandibular dysfunction is between 30 to 64 percent. So it's two to four times higher. I think if you look at these numbers, you'll think, can we explain that? The explanation can be found in the brainstem. You can see here in the middle of the slide. Uh, there is actually a connection between the dorsal cochlear nucleus and the somatosensory nucleus. That means that the connecting fibers, uh, the connecting fibers from the somatosensory system can increase spontaneous firing rates in the dorsal cochlear nucleus, uh, causing tinnitus or altering existing tinnitus. Because of this connection, we see that patients increasingly present themselves in orofacial pain clinics. However, uh, yeah, it's still difficult to manage these patients. For this reason, uh, the aim of our study was to present five cases with somatic tinnitus with a detailed description about the clinical reasoning process and applied treatment. For this study, uh, we had five patients, three women and two men with a mean age from 49 years old. Um, all patients were recruited uh, from an orofacial physical therapy clinic and get an extensive tinnitus and TMD assessment. And patients were treated with personalized based uh, on clinical examination. But the big question is, is does those patients fit within the Delphi criteria that, is, that are published in 2018 by Sarah Michiels? Here you can see the results of our patients. Um, you can see on the left slide, uh, the left side of the slide, you can see uh, the Delphi criteria of somatic tinnitus. It's important to notice that especially TMD myalgia, neck pain and bruxism are present in almost all the patients. We also found that all the, the five tinnitus patients notice a reduction of their tinnitus measured by the global perceived uh, effect score. So our conclusion was that uh, TMD myalgia, neck pain and bruxism are important criteria, but the modulation of tinnitus with movement or pressure seems to be less important. Hi, I'm Dr. Annette Vistoso Monreal, the presenting author for the work called Application of Bayesian Inference Algorithm in Orofacial Pain and Oral Medicine Diagnosis, a Retrospective Study, that will be presenting in the American Academy of Orofacial Pain Conference of 2023. 
As introduction, we want to explain that the Bayesian inference is an artificial intelligence algorithm based on the Bayes theorem that successfully uses probability to make prediction of diagnosis given observations. In our work, observation will be called all the subjective and objective findings of a patient interview and examination. The aim of our investigation was to test the integration of this algorithm into the smart note. What is a smart note? The smart note is a customized, highly structured note taking system that we created for the Orofacial Pain and Oral Medicine Center of USC. The goal of this system is to assist the clinician's diagnostic decision making process. How we did it? So, first, we integrate the Bayesian algorithm and we train with retrospective data of 1,020 clinical notes of patients seen in uh, the center from 2021 to 2022. We use Python library for the statistical analysis and the implementation of the algorithm. So from our database that we have 1,020 subjects, we divided 1,000 subjects for training and 20 subjects for testing. As a result, we have that the system with the integrated algorithm was able to predict the diagnosis with an accuracy of 98.5% and a precision of 59%. In figure two, you see an example of a page for the system where the system displays the list of the top five predicted diagnoses, which are updated as the clinician is adding new data from the patient interview and examination. In figure three, you see another example of the smart note, but in this case is the final page, where you see in one, the current top five predicted diagnoses that in this case was internal derangement with reduction, the top one, and in two, you see the actual diagnosis that was chosen by the clinician, that it was also internal derangement with the reduction according with the objective and, ob and subjective findings. So we conclude that we demonstrate the feasibility of implementing this algorithm into our node uh, taking system to support the decision making in orofacial pain and oral medicine disciplines. But we agree that future analysis with real-time patient in a much large data set will validate the acceptance and the performance of this algorithm implemented into the smart note. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Urban, a staff scientist at the U.S. Army Institute of Surgical Research. It is likely that future enemy forces will increasingly rely on various types of explosives, uh, short to long-range fire systems, and other weapons of mass destruction of the United States and its allies to unnerve, demoralize, and maximize casualties. This, combined with possible limitations to casualty evacuation, may put soldiers at high risk of blast trauma under isolated, hostile conditions. We know that blast trauma can cause rapid, widespread tissue damage, uh, inducing a complex mix of nociceptive and neuropathic pain, headache, sensory hypersensitivities and impairments, uh, sleep disturbances, and a variety of post-concussive symptoms that affect warfighter function. Further, combat and operational stress uh, can cause allodynia and worse than normal and trauma-induced pain. Unfortunately, there are no focused pain management strategies for blast-induced pain. If pain signaling pathways are hyperactive or alternatively regulated, rewired, in response to stress, they may be more susceptible to the effects of blast. Uh, in this study, sprog deli rats were treated with one week of stress or unstressed treatments followed by a single anterior blast, lateral blast, or sham trauma treatment, and then assessed uh, using a series of or acute orofacial and high paw nociceptive measures over the course of 96 hours. Uh, terminal blood samples were collected two hours after the final test, and animals were transcardially perfused and fixed. Tissues uh, were collected for histologic analyses. Stress treatments consisted of three overlapping multisensory stimuli applied continuously for seven days to produce an impending threat perception in the rats. Blast treatments were conducted using an advanced blast simulator in which uh, isoflurane anesthetized animals uh, suspended in the anterior or lateral prone positions uh, were treated with a single blast exposure. Anesthetized shams were uh, similarly treated with a comparable aversive auditory stimulus delivered at close range to the advanced blast simulator. Uh, 
We found that stress pretreatments uh, did not alter pressure pain sensitivity in the temporalis muscle regions of sham trauma controls after one hour, nor did they elicit mechanical allodynia in the periorbital regions two days later. Further, neither blast orientation induced mechanical hyperalgesia in the temporalis muscle regions of unstressed or stress-treated animals at one hour post-blast, nor did they produce mechanical allodynia in the periorbital regions two hours later. While serum corticosterone levels increased slightly for all treatments, the most pronounced was in the stressed and lateral blast treatment group. However, this was not statistically significant. No effects on weight gain were observed for any treatments. Though these results suggest acute orofacial mechanical nociception may not be affected by stress or blast treatments, analyses for the capsaicin wipe test, blue light photophobia test, and hind paw nociceptive tests are still underway, which probes other types of nociception and regions of interest. It is also possible that the onset of blast induced orofacial pain may be delayed, hence, a second study examining, late, examining later stages of pathologic development is currently underway. Thank you for your time. Good morning, everyone. Congratulations again to all of our poster presenters and particularly to our three that were just displayed here. There will be a brief Q&A for these presenters following our next presentation. And it's my pleasure at this time to introduce Dr. Linda Sangali, who has been one of our AAOP funded researchers, who she'll be presenting some of her research findings to us. Uh, Dr. Sangali completed her residency in orthodontics as well as a PhD in health technology in Brescia, Italy. She received her master's and her certificate in orofacial pain from the University of Kentucky, where during her residency, she published 12 papers. So if that doesn't make your eyeballs pop out, how in the world do you do that? Um, so clearly, Dr. Sangali uh, is also a superhero. Dr. Sangali is now an assistant clinical professor at Midwestern University in Chicago. Please welcome Dr. Linda Sangali. Thank you so much for this uh, nice presentation. I just want to figure out how to move the cursor, actually. It's like this. How do I move it? How do I proceed with the presentation? Okay, sounds good. Okay, so um, my presentation today is uh, going to target the, uh, a project that uh, it was my master project on the efficacy of brief uh, behavior telehealth intervention in a clinical or official pain setting. And uh, I have no conflict of interest to declare before starting this presentation. And uh, this is uh, the table of content of this brief presentation. So my target population is constituted by chronic musculoskeletal or official pain patients that we know being the second most common cause of chronic musculoskeletal condition after low back pain with an annual healthcare US cost of up to $4 billion. So we know that for this population, multidisciplinary management has been shown to be effective in reducing pain and uh, improve it, improving the quality of life. And uh, among these specifically, combining uh, standard care of treatment together with uh, brief uh, psychological intervention has been shown to be effective for this patient population. And in fact, in our clinic, we do have this uh, brief uh, intervention, which is called physical self-regulation or PSR. Now, PSR is constituted by three sessions, 50 minutes each, two weeks apart for each section. And uh, the patient is taught postural relaxation exercise, proprioceptive re-education, and diaphragmatic briefing. 
Historically, this uh, intervention has been delivered in person with a low uptake of intervention. However, what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic, and this is the reality of many of the artificial pain clinic in our country, is that we move uh, the intervention in uh, telehealth. However, we did not have uh, any reason, right? It was out of necessity with no data on, on the basis of doing that. So now we can see here, and this was actually one of the uh, studies that we published during my residency, that when the intervention on the left side was delivered in person, so we compare data of 2019, the intervention has a certain number of uh, people starting and completing the intervention. However, when this was provided in telehealth, now as double the participant start the intervention, and a great majority of them also complete the intervention. However, as I was mentioned before, we do have the data that uh, there was a higher uptake with a telehealth modality. But nothing is known if this was also effective. Now, if uh, intervention targeting pain can be intuitive for a patient population that suffers from chronic musculoskeletal or official pain, maybe the sleep intervention can, maybe they are not as intuitive. However, recent evidence, and also actually this, uh, this Congress so far has been focused on the overlap between sleep and pain. So recent evidence has suggested that there is a close overlap between sleep and pain. And this is not all, all, only known from general, uh, generalized body pain, but also in our clinic. And here are data, unpublished data so far, and we have been working with my colleague in, in, in the University of Kentucky, we can see that also in all official pain patient population, those that has a clinically elevated insomnia, they do have a statistically higher pain intensity compared to those that do not have clinically elevated insomnia. And the association overlap a close and linear association between pain and sleep. Therefore, in our uh, clinic, we adopted uh, from 2020 a brief behavioral therapy for insomnia or BBTI. This was uh, a conducted in telehealth from the beginning, and uh, as PSR, it has the same modality, so three sessions, 50 minutes each, two weeks apart, where the patient was uh, in particular taught sleep hygiene, stimulus control, and uh, a personalized sleep restriction. Now, there remain still some gap in the literature because, as I was saying before, we don't, ha we don't have data from our patient population in official pain if uh, these interventions are also effective. And uh, which intervention, if any, between BBTI and PSR is better. Therefore, the aim of my uh, study was indeed to test the efficacy of brief behavioral intervention delivered over telehealth in patients that, that suffer from chronic musculoskeletal or official pain in the change of pain intensity, sleep quality, and quality of life, with a second aim of uh, providing evidence, if any, if uh, any of the two interventions was more effective than the other in changing this outcome. Therefore, we designed this uh, unblind pilot randomized clinical trial over 15 months of uh, intervention at the Orofacial Pain Clinic at the University of Kentucky. This slide is pretty busy, but speak to the street inclusion and exclusion criteria. Briefly, we did um, include a patient that has uh, a diagnosis of a chronic musculoskeletal orofacial pain condition, so myofacial pain and locomyalgia, that had a self-report insomnia severity, uh, insomnia severity uh, symptomatology, and uh, um, in the exclusion criteria, the main point was that we exclude the patient that has obstructive sleep apnea that was untreated. Now, this is uh, in detail the study procedure. So the participant was seen as a first visit at the University of Kentucky with uh, an attending and with a resident uh, where a diagnosis of a chronic musculoskeletal uh, pain condition was, uh, uh, was received. Now, if the patient had uh, shown all the eligibility criteria, then a first evaluation was scheduled over telehealth with the psychology team in order to review any potential contraindication to partake in the intervention of BBTI and PSR. 
that you can see here uh, briefly uh, summarized. After the um, eligibility was confirmed, we had a participant sign the informed consent, and then we did a randomization to either three sessions of PSR or three sessions of uh, BBTI. And this is uh, the, um, the battery of, uh, our, uh, of our study. So we collected data at the pre-intervention, so before starting the PSR or the BBTI, and then we did the same collection data at the post-intervention, after the three session. What we collected was uh, a questionnaire sent through REDCap, and then these data were also uh, confirmed by eight days of daily uh, diaries sent in the morning and in the afternoon, as well as the data were confirmed and validated from uh, the use of Actigraphy Watch during the same eight, day di uh, eight days before starting the intervention. And the same was uh, conducted after the intervention. So questionnaire, sleep, eight days of sleep diaries, and activity watch. The patients were remunerated for, uh, in base on the, in base on their adherence to study complexion task. And these are the measures that were collected at different time point. For screening, we had the patient um, filling out the psych form where the insomnia severity index used as a validated tool to detect clinically elevated insomnia need to have a cutoff of 15. And uh, we uh, wanted to uh, consider the patient as eligible if the stop bank was less than five in order to reduce as possible the confounding factor coming from obstetric sleep apnea. Primary outcome were change in insomnia, in pain intensity, quality of life, and you can see here the validated questionnaire that were utilized. And uh, as secondary outcomes, we wanted to see if there was any change in uh, sleep quality, fatigue, jaw function limitation, headache disability, and uh, pain-related disability. The activity watch uh, collected this data, so total, total time in bed, total sleep time, sleep efficiency and uh, sleep onset latency that further validated what was self-reported in, uh, in, in the daily diaries. This is for full disclosure, but I'm not going to uh, present any data coming from the daily diaries in this brief presentation. However, also this is basically the daily diaries from the morning, so time in bed, wake up time, sleep onset latency, number of awakenings, quality of sleep, sleeping medication and pain interference, and these are the ones that were sent uh, in the evening. So naps, caffeine, uh, caffeinated drinks, alcoholic drinks, medication, pain intensity, mood, and self-report anxiety and tiredness. For the analysis, we consider the two groups combined, the BBTI and the PSR, in order to see if there was a change in the pre and post intervention for the first aim. Whereas the second aim was uh, um, analyze both two group uh, uh, in a, I mean, we analyze PSR compared to BBTI. Now, moving to a result. In over 15 months of observation period, we were able to consider eligible 23 participants. And we, we randomized 19 of them. And we had three dropout. So, if we look at this table, uh, this uh, presents the demo demographic of, the, of 19 uh, participants, and uh, as uh, always, we do have a higher uh, free prevalence of uh, female, which reflects the normal prevalence of the uh, artificial pain patient. All of them were Caucasian with an average age of uh, 39 years. However, when we look uh, at the primary result of the, aim, uh, the first aim, we can actually see that here we, I'm talking about 10, 10 people, okay, 10 participants, because nine of them are still in progress. So I don't have uh, the post-intervention uh, data of that. So my discussion will just uh, include the 10 participants that already finished the study. Now we can see that there was a significant improvement in uh, pain intensity, insomnia, and quality of life that uh, were our primary outcomes with the two groups combined. And also in the secondary outcomes, we did have a significant improvement in uh, fatigue, sleep quality, jaw limitation. And these are the same uh, data uh, summarized in uh, and displayed in figure. Now, when we see, uh, when we look at the um, data coming from the actigraphy, this is the sleep architecture. So we can see that the two group combined were able to statistically improve the sleep onset latency and the awakenings. So sleep onset latency went from 54 minutes, 54 minutes up to 30 minutes. So 
almost uh, uh, half, and uh, from uh, almost four awakenings to 2.5. However, what was very interesting was that if you look at the two group individually talking, there was no difference in uh, achieving the primary outcome nor the secondary outcome, and nor the sleep architecture. Now, this comes from uh, preliminary data because we are talking about six people that uh, were randomized to PSR and four that finished the BBTI. But this is really Im impressive. However, we do need to uh, disclose that there were some limitations of the study. First of all, is a small sample size, of course, I vote. Uh, uh, we have some uh, other uh, participants in progress, and uh, a low recruitment rate. This was uh, very um, interesting because uh, we do have a number in, uh, in Kentucky you know, uh, to collect all the, or to recruit all the participants that we need. But this uh, probably speaks to the fact that we did have uh, a very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. So um, we review them and uh, we uh, soften the criteria right now in order to be able to recruit more patients. And, uh, and of course, we did have actually a, a problem at first with the missing data coming from non-functioning of the, of the battery. So this pilot study was particularly fundamental in order to be able to uh, brainstorm uh, about this program. So in conclusion, these uh, are preliminary data. However, they are very re and really promising, and they speak to the fact that uh, brief behavioral intervention over telehealth are able to provide improvement in uh, sleep and insomnia and in pain. And uh, of course, a bigger sample size is needed. So uh, I, uh, we are right now uh, still uh, conducting the study. So hopefully next year we'll be able to speak more about the full data of the project. And these are the references uh, of the presentation. And uh, I absolutely want to acknowledge my team in, uh, in uh, Kentucky. So my primary mentor, Dr. Ian Boguero, um, my, uh, the director of our program, uh, Dr. Isabel modeiron Hai. The AOP uh, with uh, the funding and the also funding derived from the graduate study of the University of Kentucky, and my colleague and friend, uh, Anna Alessandri Bonetti, for continuing the study. Thank you so much. Dr. Sangali, thank you for that excellent presentation. In the interest of time, we're going to forego the Q&A. If you do have any questions for Dr. Sangali or our poster presenters, we invite you to contact them individually. Thank you again, and congratulations to our poster presenters and to Dr. Sangali.